OK, let's get this show on the road. So again, I'd like to thank you all for joining us in this webinar in which I'd like to provide you with an overview of what's required to build a production grade log management system using the Elk stack. My name's Daniel. I'm a product marketing manager at Logs.io. And what we're going to go over in the next 30 minutes or so is first what the Elk stack is and what it can be used for and the benefits of using the Elk stack versus proprietary log management solutions in the market. We're going to take a look at some of the key requirements that you'll need to plan for when building an Elk stack at scale. And finally, go over some of the common pitfalls that you're likely to encounter along the way and how to overcome them. We will have some time at the end of the webinar for some questions. So if anything pops up to mind, feel free to just type it down in the webinar chat. and I'll do my best to answer these questions, time permitting. So let's get started. What is the Elk stack? We're going to start with the basics. And I apologize to those of you who are already well versed in the ins and outs of the stack. But what exactly is the Elk stack? So the Elk in the Elk stack, of course, is an acronym for the three main building blocks comprising the stack. The E in Elk stands for Elasticsearch, the heart of the stack, if you like. Initially released in 2010, Elasticsearch is a full text search and analysis engine based on Apache Lucene and completely open source, of course. Elasticsearch is categorized as a NoSQL database, which means it stores data in an unstructured way and you can't use regular SQL to query the data. Unlike most NoSQL databases, though, Elasticsearch does have a strong focus on search uh, capabilities and features. So the easiest way to actually query the data and retrieve data from Elasticsearch is using an extensive REST API. And this is one of the main reasons why Elasticsearch is so popular. Elasticsearch was also designed to be scalable and fast and has impressive performance stats even when you're storing and querying across millions and millions of documents. The L in Elk stands for Logstash, uh, the, the stack's workhorse, so to speak, responsible for aggregating the data from your different data sources, processing that data, and then sending it on down the pipeline. It could be directly into Elasticsearch for indexing, or it could be via a buffering layer, and we'll talk more about that later on. Uh, the role Logstash plays in your stack is crucial because it allows you to filter your log messages, massage them, and shape them so it's much easier to analyze uh, down the road. The K, of course, stands for Kibana, which is the stack's pretty face and the user interface, the UI that you're going to use to analyze your data. So you can query the data in Kibana and build visualizations and those beautiful dashboards that we all like to take a look at. And we can't talk about the Elk stack without mentioning a relatively recent addition to the stack, Beats. Beats is also the reason why the ELK stack is being increasingly be referred to as the Elastic stack, simply because the letter B doesn't fit in nicely with Elk. So Beats are actually a family of log shippers. And they can be installed as lightweight agents on your hosts. And they collect and forward different types of data to either Logstash or Elasticsearch or any of the other supported outputs. So FileBeat, for example, will track log files. Uh, MetriBeat will ship different host metrics or server metrics, et cetera. And put together these four different components, they work together natively and provide us with a really powerful log management system. So Elasticsearch acts as your data warehouse, Logstash aggregates the data, processes it, and Kibana is the visualization layer on top of it all. In this webinar, we'll be talking about using the Elk stack mainly as a log management system, so for monitoring and troubleshooting your environment. But it's definitely worth mentioning that there are other use cases that the Elk stack is used for. So Elasticsearch specifically acts as a search backend for a lot of applications and websites. The stack can also be 
combined with other open source platforms for security. So you'll see that a lot of open source host and network intrusion detection systems are also based on the L stack and the back end, simply because the L stack is such a uh, powerful platform for aggregating and indexing log data. And the list goes on. You can use the L stack for IoT analysis, business intelligence, and so forth. We all know that open source software is the go-to option by a lot of teams all over the world. Um, and log management is no exception to this rule. There are, of course, a lot of proprietary log management tools out there. And Splunk, the company that virtually uh, coined the term centralized logging, they self-attest that about 15,000 companies use them for log management and log analysis. But when you compare that with the amount of companies or teams using the ELK stack, it's, it's a drop in the sea. And to understand just how popular this ELK stack is, here are some interesting stats. The different components in the stack, Elasticsearch, Logstash, uh, Kibana, the Beats, they've been downloaded over 100 million times since 2005. And perhaps more interestingly, Elasticsearch is the second most downloaded open source software after only the Linux kernel. And we're talking about over 10 million pulls of the official Elasticsearch image on the Docker Hub. So impressive stats by any account. So what explains this popularity? Why is the ELK stack uh, the go-to option for so many organizations uh, looking to deploy a log management solution, especially when you compare them to other proprietary solutions available? So the obvious reason is, of course, that the ELK stack is open source. So all the reasons that we like to use open source, it's free. Uh, there's a community backing it, developing new features, it helps us avoid vendor lock-in. And the, all of these are good enough reasons. The stack is also relatively easy to start out with. Uh, anyone can get it up and running with a simple uh, and single Docker command. Uh, what happens down the road as your organization grows and as your data grows, that's another matter. We'll talk about that soon. But to get an initial pipeline of the logs flowing is pretty straightforward. And Kibana's analysis capabilities coupled with Elasticsearch's uh, REST API that I mentioned before really provides us with a great platform for slicing and dicing our log data any way we want. And Elasticsearch, if you design it and use it and deploy it correctly, will really perform well, like I mentioned before, when searching across millions of documents. So the various components in the ELK stack were designed to interact and play nicely with each other without too much extra configuration required on our part. And in a smallish environment, say for testing or development or even any small production environment, a classic ELK stack architecture will look as follows. To collect the data from your different data sources, it could be servers or applications, containers, et cetera, you'll be using beads. FileBeat, in most cases, will be uh, collecting the data, tracking log files in case of FileBeat, perhaps performing some basic processing if you're feeling uh, somewhat adventurous, and then forwarding that data into Logstash for more advanced transformation and processing. So Logstash will aggregate the data coming in from the different beats, apply various transformation actions and filtering operations, and then send off the data to Elasticsearch for indexing. So Elasticsearch will index your data and you'll use Kibana to analyze it. So that's the basic outline of what an ELK stack architecture can look like, and it's pretty simple. Now in production, things can get somewhat more complicated. And we're suddenly looking at other components here. We've got Kafka, we've got Nginx, we've got S3, we've got Curator, so how exactly did we get to this diagram from that simple sketch that we saw before? And what I'd like to go in now is into some of the key requirements needed for running the ELK stack at scale to gain an understanding of what we need to plan for, what's important to plan for in production. 
I think we can all agree that when deploying a log management system, one of the key considerations is avoiding loss of data. The last thing we want when we're troubleshooting an issue in production is missing that one single log that's telling us exactly what happened, what transpired. So since every log message is crucial, we need to plan for resilience. Now, both Elasticsearch and Logstash are susceptible to load. If Elasticsearch is busy indexing uh, a sudden influx of log data, something that can happen with data bursts, for example, Logstash starts to work slower than normal. And a backlog can cause Logstash to slow down, sometimes even crash. And that's when we might even experience loss of data, something we just said we have to avoid in any case. So, and this is specifically where adding a buffer in front of Logstash can help us out. So it buffers the logs until all the downstream components have enough resources to index the data. And Kafka is the most common solution used in this context, but we've also seen Redis and RabbitMQ used as well. You could use a Logstash feature called persistent queues. It stores the message queue on disk in case uh, Logstash is terminated. The problem is that it doesn't really help us if there's a permanent machine failure. So if our disk fails or the machine crashes, there's no easy way to actually retrieve our data. And there are also some Logstash input plugins that aren't supported by persistent queues. So that's also something that you need to keep in mind. And one of the biggest challenges when building a production elk stack is actually making it scalable. So let's say you're monitoring an e-commerce app and it's the holidays or Black Friday, you're gonna experience a huge increase in the number of logs coming into the system. And the entire architecture will start to feel the pressure. Uh, your log stash instances will feel the pressure, your buffering layer if you've implemented it, uh, and of course, your Elasticsearch cluster. So logs can be very bursty in nature. So we wanna make sure that we can scale our ELK deployment with relative ease. So Elasticsearch, you probably know this, has a number of different node types, uh, two of which are probably the most important ones. We've got our master nodes and our data nodes. The master nodes are responsible for cluster management and the data nodes, as their name implies, are responsible for the data. So at a minimum, you need to plan for at least three master nodes, and this is to avoid the split brain scenario. The split brain scenario is when, in case of a network issue, there's a dispute between two nodes uh, about regarding which one is actually the master. Uh, as far as your data nodes go, you need to plan for having at least two data nodes to make sure that data is replicated at least once. So that's a minimum of five nodes three master nodes, these can be smallish machines, and your two data nodes, these probably should be deployed on stronger machines with faster storage and a larger capacity for memory. Now, regardless of where you're deploying the Elk stack, it could be Amazon or Google Cloud, or even in your own data center, to make sure you've got high availability, you need to plan for having an Elasticsearch cluster running in different availability zones, or in case of a data center, your own data center, different segments of that data center. You also need to think in terms of running multiple Logstash instances uh, for the incoming logs and, and some kind of buffer in front of each of these uh, Logstash instances. Now, logs contain a lot of sensitive information, so it's really important that we protect our Elasticsearch clusters. I'm not sure if you guys are aware of this, but every week you hear of another incident where an insecure Elasticsearch cluster got hacked. Uh, I think it was last year where thousands of insecure Elasticsearch clusters on Amazon were hacked by a ransomware attack. So it's definitely not something we want to experience, but the good news is that there are some basic steps that we can take to secure Elasticsearch. So we can change default ports and we can bind Elasticsearch to a secure IP. But the bad news is that for more advanced or granular security controls, we're pretty much on our own because a vanilla Elk stack comes without any authentication 
functionality built in, so there's no easy ways around it. A common solution uh, is installing Nginx as a reverse proxy in front of Elasticsearch and Kibana, and this allows us to implement either basic HTTP authentication or LDAP and encrypt communication with SSL and TLS. Another option includes SearchGuard, another free security plugin for Elasticsearch, and it also allows us to add role-based access and encryption. Data retention. So how long do we need to retain our data for? This is a super critical question when deploying a log management solution. And for some organizations, especially the larger ones, a literally a million dollar question. And the answer will, of course, vary from company to company, from team to team. You might need to retain data for compliance. You might need to back up your data, or you might need it for long-term trend analysis. In either case, it's a huge challenge, especially in large deployments, because Elasticsearch indices tend to quickly grow in size, and this will become uh, quite a resource and indeed an architectural challenge down the road. So regardless of your motive, and it depends on how long you want to retain data for, you need to have some kind of process set up that will automatically delete old Elasticsearch indices. Otherwise, we'll simply be left with too much data and our Elasticsearch cluster will crash, and this might result in losing data. And to prevent this from happening, there are a couple ways around it. You could use Elasticsearch Curator to delete indices. You could even set up a Chrome job that automatically spawns up Curator with the relevant parameters to delete any of the old indices. Another useful tool is Elastic Dump. Uh, which can back up and restore or re-index data based on specific Elasticsearch queries. You could use Elasticsearch Snapshot API as well to create and restore snapshots of whole indices, either stored in files or in S3 buckets. So the latest version of Elasticsearch 6.6, uh, released a couple of weeks ago, actually includes a new feature called index lifecycle management. And it sounds like it could help us with some of this specific pain because it allows us to index in different phases with different policies. So uh, hot, warm, cold, different retention uh, scenarios. And it's a totally new feature. Uh, so information is a bit sketchy. So more on that probably later this year. Of course, collecting, storing, and searching our logs is nice, but without some kind of mechanism to alert us and notify us when something is taking place, we're kind of being passive in our log management and in our log analysis. So to be a bit more proactive, we want to know when something is taking place, when a specific event has occurred. And sadly, like with authentication, the vanilla elk stack comes without any alerting feature built in, so we'll need to hack our own solution. A common open source option is Elastalert, uh, developed by the folks at Yelp. Elastalert works by combining Elasticsearch with rule types and alerts. So Elasticsearch is periodically queried, and the data is passed to a rule type, which determines if a match is found, and if a match is found, a specific action takes place based on that rule type. Another open source option is Sentinel, developed by Siren Solutions, which also adds alerting and reporting uh, capabilities to the Elk stack. So that can also help us out in getting alerted when specific events take place. There are other open source and paid alerting plugins for the Elk stack, but each of these, of course, require deployment, maintenance, upgrading, and in case of a paid solution, extra costs. So keep that in mind. So going back to the diagram from before, we can actually start to understand it. We've got Kafka here acting as a buffer in front of our Logstash instances, and we're using uh, multiple Logstash instances here to ensure data resiliency. We're using Elasticsearch clusters with three master nodes and two data nodes each. We are using Elasticsearch Curator to delete old indices 
and we are archiving to an S3 bucket. We've installed Elastalert for alerting, and we've deployed Nginx as a proxy server to add authentication. And you'll notice that we've replicated this architecture in two Amazon availability zones for high availability. So this is just a recommendation based on those key requirements that we just outlined before. Uh, every organization will be different. Every ELK deployment will look a bit different, but this is the basic outline according to those key requirements. To sum it up, here's a checklist of the requirements that we need to take into consideration when building or at least planning to build the ELK stack at scale. We want to build resilient data pipelines because like we said, we can't afford to lose any data. We wanna make sure our architecture is scalable uh, with high availability to make sure we can handle data growth and data bursts. We wanna make sure our data is safe, of course, and secure. So we wanna add authentication and encryption into the pipelines. Uh, the more accurately our data is passed and processed, the easier analysis is going to be down the road. So we wanna make sure that we take the time to configure passing correctly in Logstash. We need to plan for long-term retention. Um, so for troubleshooting, maybe a few days is enough, but for other use cases, you're probably going to need to make sure that you have enough resources for extended retention. Uh, and we need automatic processes in place to take care of old indices and archiving and backups. We wanna build alerting into the stack because we wanna make sure we're a bit more proactive in our log analysis. And last but not least, we want to monitor whatever we can. So ingestion rates, lags in Kafka, Elasticsearch indices, Logstash performance, all of these are key metrics and key components that we need to monitor to make sure that our ELK stack logging pipelines are performing as uh, required. So, we provided an overview of what's required to deploy the ELT stack at scale. And in this last part of the webinar, what I'd like to do is go over some common mistakes or pitfalls, if you like, that need to be taken into consideration and some ways of overcoming them. And we'll start with Elasticsearch. We've already talked about cluster size, and if you remember, I recommended at least two data nodes and three master nodes to help avoid the split brain scenario and make sure we have a stabler uh, cluster. And once our data grows, you might find that your data nodes are starting to feel some pressure. So you might wanna think about using coordinator nodes to balance the load. And when a cluster reaches a very, very large size, say in the tens or even the hundreds, it becomes quite a challenge to manage. And you might wanna start thinking about splitting your clusters into more manageable units uh, per use case. A lot of Elasticsearch performance issues can actually be tracked to how you design your indices and shards in the cluster. Uh, how you manage indices and shards is probably a topic for a webinar, maybe two webinars even, but as a rule of thumb, you wanna try and avoid large shards because this affects how well your cluster will recover from a failure. There's no fixed limit on how large shards should actually be, but 30 to 80 gigabytes is the quoted ballpark for most use cases. And you don't wanna have too many indices and shards in your cluster, this also affects performance, you want to try and simulate your actual use case. So boot up your nodes, fill them up with real documents and push them until your shard breaks. Uh, you want to closely monitor the heap usage on your master nodes to make sure that sizing is appropriate. And if you have made a mistake, you can actually increase the number of shards or reduce the number of shards using shrink API. As you probably know, uh, Elasticsearch maps fields automatically, but in a lot of cases, it's not exactly accurate. Uh, data sometimes changes, so 
for example, Elasticsearch might index a field initially as an integer, and then later that field changes to a real number, and the results are mapping conflicts, and then you need to start to re-index your data. Now, there's some ways of overcoming this. You could use Elasticsearch dynamic templates uh, to instruct Elasticsearch how to treat specific fields and then how to handle mapping errors. Another best practice is to actually index a few documents allow Elasticsearch to guess the field type and then grab the mapping created and make some changes without leaving too much up to chance. All right, Logstash. So we said that Logstash plays a crucial role in our pipeline, but the truth is that it's still one of the key pain points or main pain points in deploying the Elk stack. And one of the reasons is it's tough to configure. Um, Logstash has hundreds of different plugins, input plugins, filter plugins, output plugins. Each has their own options, their own syntax instructions, differently located configuration files. And if you take this, you understand that configuring Logstash is a challenge. Uh, as a rule of thumb, uh, you want to try to keep your Logstash configuration file as simple as possible. This also affects performance. There is a tendency uh, by Logstash users to use too many plugins. So try and use only the plugins you need. And again, this affects performance. If you can test your Logstash configuration in a sandboxed environment before you deploy in production, there are a couple of online tools that will help you test your configuration. So one of them is the Grok Debugger, a free online tool that helps you test your Grok patterns. Logstash runs on JVM, and it consumes quite a lot of resources to do this. Uh, the good news here is that this specific pain point has indeed improved in recent versions, and there's also talk of an alternative execution engine in the works. But until then, you can try and outsource some of the processing, some of the basic processing to either Filebeat, which now supports some processors, or Elasticsearch ingest nodes. Uh, you can use Logstash's monitoring API, available since version 5, if I'm not mistaken, to identify specific bottlenecks in your parsing, in your processing, uh, and try and troubleshoot from there. You'll see that Logstash starts to be a bit sluggish uh, in case of limited system resources, or if logs are coming into the system that don't suit your configuration file, so you need to closely monitor some key system metrics just to make sure that you're keeping tabs on Logstash. So monitor your host CPU, IO, memory, and JVM heap, uh, and be ready to actually fine tune your configurations accordingly, like raising your JVM heap size or raising the number of pipeline workers. So Kibana is a great tool for as a UI, and we mentioned this before, but it's just a UI. Uh, as such, how Kibana and Elasticsearch talk to each other will directly affect how well you succeed in analyzing your data. And it's easy to miss some basic steps um, needed to make sure that the if Kibana and Elasticsearch are talking together properly. So you wanna verify that your ports are configured correctly, and that both Kibana and Elasticsearch are configured to talk to each other. Of course, if you've got no data indexed in Elasticsearch to start with, or you haven't defined the index pattern properly in Kibana, there's not much analysis work that you can do in Kibana. So A, first, you want to make sure that Elasticsearch is indeed indexing your data. You can do this simply by querying uh, Elasticsearch. And B, that you've got the correct index pattern defined in Kibana. Uh, Kibana supports a lot, a lot of different queries, and this is one of the main reasons why the Elk stack and Kibana are so popular. Uh, but some queries are problematic, and that can actually cause performance issues. So, for example, if you perform a leading wildcard search on a large data set, that can actually cause your system to stall. So that's something you want to avoid, and we've got a list of other problematic queries on our blog, so feel free to take a look. There are also some specific settings that you want to uh, try and avoid tampering with. So for example, 
and this depends on what browser you're using and what system settings you've got up, uh, but changing the value of the discover sample size setting to a high number might cause your browser to freeze. And again, we've got a list of other um, similar settings that you don't want to touch in our blog, so take a look. So to sum things up, the Elk Stack is indeed a really powerful uh, log management platform. That combination of Elasticsearch and Logstash and Kibana and Beats is a powerful combination. And the main reason why the Elk Stack is today probably the world's most popular log management system, um, whether open source or not. Now, like I explained, deploying a production grade Elk Stack involves a number of key considerations or requirements that you've got to take into account. Uh, and when added up, they can be a engineering challenge to any team or organization. It doesn't mean it can't be done. Of course it can be done. It just means that you need to plan carefully and take all of these factors into consideration. Before we go to questions, here's a few resources that will actually help you on your Elk Stack journey. Uh, the Logzeo Complete Elk Guide contains all the information you need to learn about setting up the Elk Stack, building out some data pipelines, and how to overcome some of the challenges that we spoke about before. Uh, our blog, the Logzeo blog, contains some great information on the Elk Stack, but not only the Elk Stack. Uh, we try to update it regularly with details on new features in the stack and how to use them. Of course, Elastix Docs are also uh, a great resource to use. They've got a lot of useful technical information as well about installing the stack, the different components, and how to operate them. OK, time for some questions. And I can see. We've got quite a backlog of questions, and of course, we're somewhat limited for time, but I'll try and answer as many as possible. So let's jump right in. Question number one, how long would you estimate it would take to set up the architecture you showed in the diagram? Uh, <laughs> that would be a classic it depends answer, uh, I'm afraid. So there's so many different factors here. Some of them we, we mentioned in the webinar. So how long do you need to retain data for? How much data are you shipping? Um, what's the budget you have available? Uh, what kind of manpower do you have available? But what usually companies usually do, they start out with building a pretty basic deployment, and then they'll slowly scale it up. Uh, and setting up that initial deployment could be a matter of a day or two, but the problem is as your application grows, as you start developing more services, uh, adding new log types, configuration becomes more complicated, uh, and then slowly the Elk stack starts to build out and scale up. Uh, so it's a gradual process. Uh, it could take a couple of months, even more. And again, it will depend on all those factors that we uh, mentioned earlier. I hope that answered the question. Uh, question number two, is there any way to gauge the actual cost of an elk stack? That's another it depends question. Um, I suppose there's no easy way to calculate the number in actual dollars. Um, but what I recommend doing is first try to design the architecture that you want to build. Try and map out the different components that you want to implement. So do we want to use Kafka? Do we want to ensure high availability? Uh, do we want to pay for extra plugins, paid plugins for alerting, for example? Uh, and then we can try and quantify this into engineering hours, right? How long we think we estimate it'll take to build these different components. And of course, these engineering hours can translate into actual cost, right? So Oh, and of course, we've got to estimate our infrastructure costs. So that's another calculation that you need to do. So how many instances, what type of instances, how much memory do we need, et cetera. 
So I think this cost estimation is a project in itself. Uh, and a lot of it is trial and error, no doubt. I'm afraid that's the best answer I can provide at this stage. How do I know how many indices and shards I need? So I think I tried to answer this before, and I'm sorry if I wasn't clear enough. There are no out of the box numbers uh, that will fit everybody's use case. Uh, 30 to 80 gigabytes is the quoted ballpark for shard size. And I know it's quite the wide range. Uh, like I said, you don't want to have too many shards and indices in your cluster. This affects performance. And actually, there's a nice benchmarking tool called Rally that I wrote about a couple of weeks ago. You can check the article on our blog. And it actually helps you test load and performance, I think. The only way to actually find that balance for your needs is by testing, by benchmarking, uh, et cetera. Uh, we'll take one more question. What's the recommended way of installing the Elk stack? Can we dockerize it? You can definitely dockerize the entire stack. There's even a great Docker image uh, on the Docker Hub that will help you install all the components with port forwarding, set out for you with data volume set up. Uh, you can even uh, deploy it with Kubernetes. Uh, but then I think that might add another level of complexity that you definitely need to think about. I, I think the most common deployment method that I've seen is on EC2 instances on Amazon. And I guess that's the, the reasons are obvious. So you can easily scale up the stack, um, provides us with on-demand resources, uh, etc. Okay, uh, we're going to have to wrap this up. Again, I apologize for not getting to all your questions, uh, but we do have a record of these questions, so we'll definitely try and take this offline and get back to you with some answers. Again, thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, hopefully, we'll see you in our next webinar. Thank you.